So you're unemployed, but you're getting cash, but you don't have childcare, or you're essential, you're not getting hazard pay. Sometimes arrangements for childcare have been worked out, but generally you still have to like figure out your own childcare and you're worried about getting sick on the job. It's a bifurcation and, and it's not entirely obvious, and I'm sure it goes both ways depending on, depending on everything, but uh, you know, would you rather have been a retail worker taking unemployment or would you have rather been a home healthcare aide keeping your job, keeping your health benefits, important, but being worried about getting sick. My name is Suresh Naidu. I'm a professor of economics and public affairs at Columbia University. My research interests are broadly in political economy and historical labor markets. So I've studied everything from American slavery to uh, um, the effects of democracy on economic growth to uh, uh, monopsony in modern day labor markets and labor unions and so kind of the whole spectrum of things. You know, we're asked, oh, what does the pandemic reveal about the economy? But in some ways, you know, the pandemic has changed the economy in lots of ways. And, and there's new things that we've learned about not even the underlying structure of the economy, but just actually the economy under COVID. So, I mean, I think one of the interesting things is particularly, uh, you know, this is what someone on the internet called like the first service sector recession, where it's really like a huge shock to the particular kinds of services that have to be delivered in person. So this is why the hemorrhaging of jobs in retail and restaurants, uh, which are really low wage sectors, has been so salient. But then on the other side of that, we have other service sector jobs that are deemed essential work, nurses, uh, uh, healthcare aides, that some of them are also low wage jobs. And those are you know, those jobs have not disappeared. But I think because these labor markets are tied together, uh, those jobs, which you'd expect to see a big increase in wages due to all the hazards of working in a care-related or service-related profession after uh, dur during a pandemic, we haven't really seen much evidence of that. So there were some big uh, um, retailers, for example, like Amazon, that gave a big hazard pay bonus, or Kroger's, and uh, and then they kept it for about six months and then took it away, even though COVID had gone had gone nowhere. Um, and so the the absence of that kind of uh, you know compensating differential that we call in economics, I find interesting, and it suggests, and because I kind of constantly have labor market power on the brain, it sort of it, I read it as kind of evidence that um, because the unemployment rate is so high, even essential workers don't have the bargaining power that lets them kind of ask for higher wages in exchange for this job. So in a normal sort of tight labor market, if you were worried about getting sick on your job, you'd basically go to your employer and say, I need a raise or I'm out of here. But in an environment with, you know, eight, seven, ten percent unemployment, that threat to walk away from your employer just isn't really credible. And so your employer doesn't really ha face any pressures to raise your wages, even though your risk of getting sick on the job is a lot higher. And part of that is an interesting thing, which I think also points to the, to the divergence and what gets called the, the K-shaped recovery in the low-wage labor market. So for example, you'll have a number of, of low-wage workers that have just lost their jobs, but then they got eligible for like a really big UI increase. And I think it's not as appreciated as it should be just how generous the CARES Act was, particularly on the unemployment insurance margin, which basically it topped up unemployment insurance by $600 a week um, for, for unemployed workers, which just think $600 a week for a worker making the federal minimum wage at $40, a, at, at 40 hours a week, that goes, that's effectively $15 an hour at 40 hours a week. And for for not and not working, and so we just have I think like a whole group of you know generally low wage poor workers that as a result of cares got a pretty big bump up in their uh, in their income. And now that has to be traded off against I think some of the other things that are happening inside the 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 household, which is for example the closing of schools and childcare, uh, and I'll say this as a parent, it's just a huge uh, blow to not just even have like the regular uh, childcare support. And so the, the, another part of it is this closing of like the public goods that the government offers. And so, you know, you have to kind of have for 
a whole bunch of these workers, you're getting a combination of, so you're unemployed, but you're getting cash, but you don't have childcare, or you're essential, you're not getting hazard pay. Sometimes arrangements for childcare have been worked out, but generally you still have to like figure out your own childcare and, uh, uh, and you're worried about getting sick on the job. And so I think this like, it's a bifurcation and, and it's not entirely obvious, and I'm sure it goes both ways depending on, depending on everything, but uh, you know, would you rather have been a retail worker taking unemployment or would you have rather been a home healthcare aide uh, uh, getting, keeping your job, keeping your health benefits, important, but, uh, um, but being worried about getting sick um, in this in this super hazardous environment and ineligible for UI and I think like this is like an interesting thing that ac around the world and it's something I would like to study more is that you know you're not eligible for unemployment insurance if you voluntarily quit and so that means that like wh where unemployment insurance could be a backstop for workers like uh, you know, against uh, all kinds of abuses of employer authority or poor working conditions is just not allowed to be. Um, and there's like exemptions in some places for, uh, you know, you can quit for health or safety reasons, but then you generally have to get a labor lawyer to fight for you. <laughs> to, uh, um, and, uh, and so that kind of um, thing where like our social safety net is kind of deliberately designed to not provide a backstop to worker bargaining power, I find that that's one thing that's been revealed <laughs> uh, 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 during the pandemic. I'm sort of an optimist in that I think we, America has no problems that five years of basically full employment wouldn't fix. <laughs> um, maybe that makes me an optimist, maybe that makes me a pessimist. But, uh, uh, you know, if you could actually figure out how to deliver, you know, five plus years of unemployment at close to like two or three uh, percent, I'm enough of a believer in the forces of supply and demand to think that that would drive up wage growth, that would uh, just be like overall economic growth. It would uh, basically bring down the uh, like all kinds of balance sheet to GDP ratios. Um, and it would kind of, that would be the Great Reset in some ways would be just kind of a, a, a boom sort of somewhat similar to the post-war uh, boom of just like many, many years of pretty high, un uh, pretty high employment. Um, and how we get there, I think, is the question. And it does sort of feel like it's not clear that the standard channel of liberalize credit to the banks and let the banks push it out to private employers and they'll create jobs. It's not clear that that works anymore and so that we need uh, so I think like the ambitious fiscal policies need to be there, but I'll, I think complementing just the amount of money, the real like American state capacity and the ability to like deliver that money and turn it into jobs and to uh, turn it into like useful goods and services, that really needs to be built back. And that's kind of undergone, I think, a long set of deterioration. We can just see it with the vaccine rollout. We can see it with all kinds of things that just kind of the, the bureaucratic machinery of getting things done quickly uh, the American state just needs to be able to do that and needs to be able to do that partly just to get to this full employment thing, but partly because we need, obviously, a whole set of things from the government in the way of, like, efficiently provided public goods and, uh, you know, effective regulation that we would, you know, we demand uh, uh, a more competent technocracy uh, uh, in, in the domains that we want technocracy to work in. It should be competent and accountable. It still seems that the only degrees that qualify you for a job in the federal government are an economics PhD or a JD. And I don't understand why the diversity of, into, of academic portfolios going into the government isn't larger. Here's just throwing a balloon in the air, which is that um, the rise of computer scientists, both in kind of everything in our world obviously now depends on computer science in a really deep way, but in particular, m a lot more social science is getting done by computer scientists, and they're bringing their own kind of metaphors and, uh, uh, and analytical tools to doing social science. And I don't think they're gonna replace uh, uh, um, economics or sociology, but I do wonder if like the metaphors and analogies that come from 
our increasing use of tools from computer science and just collaborations with computer science will wind up meaning that we're thinking about um, institutional design in different ways. So for example, like instead of like trying to figure out the optimum best, we start thinking about like, like engineers, like guaranteeing the worst case can't be too bad. And just kind of there's a different library of, of tools that um, computer scientists bring to studying problems that I wonder if they'll become kind of the, an architecture of a social theory as well in the way that economics wasn't just like about figuring out the optimal tax. It became like a metaphor for philosophers, for political scientists to use to study all kinds of problems. I wonder if we're going to kind of get there with computer science as kind of like the master metaphor.